This is Terry Sound Business. This podcast comes from our monthly speaker series, Terry Third Thursday, held in Buckhead at the Atlanta Executive Education Center. Third Thursday programs feature influential speakers as well as special guests from the University of Georgia who bring local and global perspectives on business and innovation. For reservations to attend the Third Thursday Breakfast and Lecture, please visit terry.uga.edu slash ttt. For more information about this podcast and other great business content from the Terry College of Business at the University of Georgia, please log on to terry.uga.edu slash podcasts. I am Porter Lummis, and I'm on the Terry College Board, and I'm also the current chairman of the Terry Third Thursday Program. Uh, thank you all for coming today and finding us here, here at the uh, Sonova Center. Um, I want to start by uh, uh, extending a few thank yous. In particular, I want to thank Sonovas. They're our presenting sponsor. Uh, and they've also agreed to loan us this space for the next four months while we do some construction at the Terry Executive Education Center. So we'll be here, uh, as it looks like, through our, our June Terry third Thursday. I also want to thank our media sponsors, the Atlanta Business Chronicle and Public Broadcasting Atlanta, WABE 90.1. And I also want to thank Christine Smith, Natalie Glenn, and Kate Hackling, uh, who do most of the lead work to make this program happen, do a lot of other things to keep Terry running smoothly. Uh, they never seem to get all the credit they deserve. So please join me in thanking all these folks and hard work and labor. Before we get to today's speaker, we've got some announcements to make. Uh, we'll start by talking about some of our upcoming speakers. Uh, in April, we've got men's basketball coach Tom Crean coming to talk with us. Uh, we're pretty thoughtful on how we plan the speakers, but we got really lucky. Uh, he'll be coming to speak with us the day after National Signing Day for the uh, men's basketball program. And in case you haven't been paying attention, uh, we currently have the number one recruiting class in the nation for men's basketball right now. Pretty incredible after one year on the job and a pretty tough season on the hardwood uh, that he's got the number one overall recruit in the nation and I think the number 6 year recruit in the nation. Our class is ranked ahead of Duke, North Carolina, Kentucky, and Kansas right now. So pretty incredible accomplishment. We'll be uh, hearing from him the day after signing day. In May, Carol Yancey, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer for Genuine Parts Company, will be our speaker. Genuine Parts is a distribution company, a Fortune 500 company, based here in Atlanta. And Carol is also a Terry alum, which always makes it a special event for us. In June, we have Frank Patterson, who is the president of Pinewood Studios. Pinewood Studios is a uh, UK-based uh, film studio company. Uh, in 2014, they purchased 700 acres here in Fayette County and have built a, basically a mini city down there, including 18 sound studios. Um, pretty incredible what they've done. He'll be here to talk about what Pinewood has accomplished so far uh, and about the TV and film industry in the state of Georgia. In July, as a reminder, we do not have a Terry Third Thursday in July, so you're free to plan your family vacation during the third week of July without worrying about missing one of these events. Uh, Terry Executive Education Center, I mentioned uh, we are under construction, if you include demolition as your part of your definition of construction. Uh, things are underway there. There was some thought we'd be back in, in that space in time for the June meeting, but that's uh, while the final decision had been made, it's, it's like we'll be here in June and we'll have our first uh, meeting in the new facility in August. Big Terry construction update, Orkin Hall and Ibister Hall. In spite of near record rainfall in Georgia last year, uh, these facilities are going to be delivered somewhat ahead of schedule and also a little bit under budget. Uh, we think we'll be in those buildings before the end of May and perhaps even early in May. So uh, great job by the project team there. And lastly, it wouldn't be a Terry event if we didn't mention the Terry Gala, uh, which is going to be held on April 27th this year here in Atlanta at the Intercontinental Hotel in Buckhead. Cocktails start at 6 o'clock, followed by a dinner program where we'll recognize the Terry Distinguished alum and our outstanding young alum. Uh, we have a silent auction. There's also a live auction. It's a very entertaining event. If you haven't been, I recommend that you do so. Uh, tickets are still available as our sponsorships. So uh, if you're interested in that, you can find me or Christine or Natalie or Kate or someone after the meeting would be happy to help you. For 
those of you that regularly attend this meeting, you know that Dean Ayers typically handles uh, these introductions and the announcements. Um, ben was skiing out west last week, fell and broke his leg. Um, yeah, I uh, don't have a lot of details, but he's back in Georgia, resting comfortably, but didn't want to make the effort to get here today. So. I have filled in for Ben previously, and it's always an honor, but I was particularly honored to be able to handle these introductions today because I know our speaker well. I have great admiration for him, respect for what he's done for us, and I consider him to be a good friend. Uh, beyond that, my wife and I will always be indebted to Dr. Shavastiv because uh, thanks to his influence, our daughter is now a Georgia Bulldog and not a Vanderbilt Commodore or a Wake Forest Demon Deacon, so we will forever be indebted to you for that. Dr. Shavastiv earned his undergraduate and master's degrees at the University of Mysore in his native India. Um, he then came to the United States and received his PhD from the University of Indiana in speech and hearing sciences. In somewhat of an unfortunate turn of events, he started his instructional career in 2002 as a gator uh, down at the University of Florida. Ooh, yeah. I have no origin proof at all. <laughs> He spent 10 years in Gainesville uh, as an associate professor and director of the Voice Acoustics and Perception Laboratory there. In 2012, Dr. Shavastev received the blessing of being recruited away from Florida by Michigan State University to chair their Department of Communicative Sciences and Disorders. His efforts in this role produced five new research laboratories, along with considerable expansion in the department faculty and research funding. Dr. Shavastev joined us at the University of Georgia in 2015 as Vice President for Instruction. And when I first heard this title, I thought it meant he was in charge of all teaching at university, but I came to find that it involves much more than that. He currently oversees more than 20 offices and programs for our university, including undergraduate admissions, financial aid, registration, our curriculum, student advising, STEM education, online learning, and various other academic support units. Since coming to the University of Georgia, Dr. Shavastev and his team have successfully launched uh, our Double Dogs program, which allows students to enroll and get their undergraduate and master's degrees in five years. Something I was excited to learn about, uh, he started our Experiential Learning Initiative that now requires all undergraduate students to engage in hands-on experiential learning as a requirement for graduation. And what I think is the most life-changing uh, initiative he's undertaken was the work to create the Georgia Commitment Scholarship Program, which provides four-year scholarships to particularly needy students, along with a variety of programs and sports services to ensure student success. The program's only two years old. They've already raised more than $25 million and provided scholarships to more than 350 students. Very much a life-changing activity. Beyond his academic and research accomplishments, when getting to know Dr. Shavastiv, I learned one thing that had me particularly excited to have him in a leadership role at our university. Prior to coming to UGA, he also co-founded and served as chief scientist at Autogens Inc., which is a startup private business that commercialized his laboratory research, which focused on measuring the performance of digital hearing devices. Through his research and this work, he currently holds 10 United States patents. Autogens successfully secured more than $4 million in funding before exclusively licensing its technology to the creators of the cochlear hearing implant. It is quite rare to find someone with such considerable academic and private sector success, and to have private sector success with an entrepreneurial startup is even more rare. We are truly fortunate to have him in a leadership position at the University of Georgia, and is our speaker this morning. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shavastin. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Porter, for that very kind introduction. Um, it's, it's really an honor to be here. And before I start talking about experiential learning, let me just introduce to, us, to everybody Andrew Porter, our brand new, as in what, one month in the job now? Five weeks. Five weeks um, since he started at UGA. 
uh, director for our Office of Experiential Learning. So before you leave today, I'm sure you want to meet Andrew and um, talk to him about how all of you can engage with this really, really important uh, initiative uh, for the university. Um, you know, you've, you've seen the headlines around UGA, and I, I don't need to tell you all the good stuff that's happening at the university. It's, it's just been a place that's rocking and moving, and it's, it's an exciting place to go to work and um, drive the, all the changes that are happening. Uh, let me just give you some, some big picture, where we are, where we are going, before I get into why experiential learning and what, why it's so important for us and for our students. Um, you know, here's our application data. Um, the number of people applying to UGA keeps increasing. This is the data for last year. I, we just released our admissions about a week ago. This number will be somewhere up here when we release it next year. We had 29,300 applicants for about 5,000 few hundred positions, uh, openings as freshmen. We, we want this line to stay about where it is. Those of you who are in the know, there's one residence hall that will be shut down this summer for renovation, which means we are about 968 beds short. So we are working very hard to make sure this doesn't go up um, as much as our application numbers are going up. And just like any other industry, higher ed has its own KPIs. We are used to different KPIs. But we look at several things. Who are our students? This is our last year's class, roughly 5,700 students. Average SAT score of 1,400. I stopped talking about GPA because everybody's with the 4.0. Um, ACT of 30. Uh, high, you know they are high. What you may or may not know is these numbers are top five to eight percentile in the country. 30 ACT is roughly 92, uh, last year's data is roughly 91, 92 percentile in the country. What, what I'm trying to highlight here is we really have an exceptionally good student body coming into the university. Other KPIs we look at are where they go. These are our top majors, everything from biology, several Terry College majors, uh, some communication arts majors. What we are seeing nationally, but somewhat amplified at the university, the interest is very largely driven in the science, technology, healthcare fields. Healthcare is now a roughly 16% of our GDP nationally, so obviously a lot of opportunity, a lot of uh, employment, a lot of uh, possibilities for innovation. Uh, STEM, computer science, engineering, which was really small, it's become our third or fourth largest college in just a few years. Um, computer science numbers have tripled in the time. I've been on this job for about five years, four years now, and I think in five years the number of students in computer science degrees is close to three times what it used to be. Uh, Terry College, as you all probably know, keeps expanding every year to the point where there are plans to effectively put a ceiling on how many people get in there as majors and then expand other ways to engage students. So a lot of, lot of excitement around STEM and business <coughs> disciplines. And then the non-STEM and business disciplines, the social and behavioral sciences, the arts and humanities, there's massive changes in their curriculum and their offerings in the works that will make those, employ those students more sort of well tailored for the modern workforce than they have historically been. And EL becomes a key part of that effort. Other big KPIs, and this is the interesting stuff that higher ed tends to look at, are the first year retention rate, which is how many students who start school come back to the same school next year. The national average is roughly 70, 72%. We are about 80, 90, 96%. We are almost as high as we could be. The other metric that people look at nationally is the six-year graduation rate. How, how many students who start will finish degrees within a six-year time frame? Again, the national average hovers around 60, 62%. We are about 86%. We lose two to 3% students every year. So by five years, we've lost 15%. Everybody else pretty much graduated. 
Now, those people we lose, most of them we don't lose we lose them for the right reasons, in my opinion. So a student comes in a year or two later, decides they want to pursue an art degree and move it, moves into a school which has a major MFA program, or nursing is another one. Um, you know, so they are moving. There are students who uh, get into pharmacy. It's a good example. Um, in pharmacy, the admission. You don't wait to finish your undergraduate degree. You get into the pharmacy program, typically in your second or third year. So that 3% that we are losing, a large number of those are moving for reasons that are appropriate for that particular student. We lose some for financial reasons, for personal reasons, for family reasons. I wish there were ways we could address that. And to the extent possible, we try to do that. Bottom line is. On the key metrics that higher ed is evaluated on, we are way ahead of where the country is. Couple other metrics. One is what do students do after they graduate? Um, and that's the outcomes rate. 96%, this is again last year's data, 96% of our students who graduated were either gainfully employed or were in pursuing some professional graduate school education literally within six months of graduating. A uh, good number, we don't control all of it. Some of it is what happens with the economy. But again, we are nearly 12% above the national average. 58% of them were employed before they ever graduated. Uh, another 30% within three months, and then 90% of them were employed within six months of graduation. And yet another KPI we look at is what's called the cohort loan default rate. This is numbers that the federal government puts out. What they look at is of all the students who took federal loans, how many of them start defaulting three years after after they graduate. And, you know, it's a measure of how successful our students are after they finish school. And that reflects on what we do for them as, as an institution. Again, national average, nearly around 11%. We are down at 2.4%. Uh, our projections for next year is it'll go down another a tenth of a percent or so. Less than a quarter of what's happening nationally. So, you know, while most of my colleagues are figuring out and spending every day saying, how do we prevent people from failing and not finishing school or being gainfully employed? I am one of a few people in the whole country where I don't have to worry about it. Instead, the opportunity for me and my team is what else can we do? How do we push the envelope? How do we do more for our students so when they go out, they have a competitive advantage? And what we are trying to do is to really look out for the future. We are not worried about dropping people off the ceiling. We are worried about how do we push the envelope and getting them better qualified, better skilled, better prepared for what the future holds. And that's where experiential learning is a major, major effort for us at the university. So in fall of 2016, I'm um, sure you've all heard about this, we, we created the Experiential Learning Initiative. And what that is, in a nutshell, is it's requiring every student to do at least one hands-on learning experience before they finish school. Now, it, we are neither the first ones to do it, nor are we unique in valuing this, but we are unique in many ways. Uh, first of all, we are the first ones to do it at the scale that we are trying to do it. We have 29,600 some students, undergraduate students, last year. We need to create a way to get everybody the experience. It's really easy to do this if I'm in a small liberal arts school with 1,200 students, but we have 29,000 students. How do we do it for everybody? It's really easy if I'm in an engineering school where everybody has to do a capstone project because it's required for accreditation, and that becomes your hands-on learning project. It's very difficult when you have 130 majors and you have to think about this for effectively for anything from arts and accounting to veterinary science or marine biology or psychology or whatever you have it. Some disciplines, some majors, they've always done it. You never go into 
a healthcare system and become a physician or a nurse or a speech pathologist or a genetic counselor without ever having spent time with a patient. So in, in some of those things, healthcare is a good example, education is another example, some parts of business are really good examples where these experiences are baked into the education model. It has always been that way. But then there are others, whether it's the sciences like biology or physics or chemistry, the social sciences or behavior sciences like psychology or sociology, um, or you know some of the arts and humanities. This is all very novel to them. And the reason this becomes important to us is as the workforce is changing, those traditional majors and those traditional degrees have less and less importance and value. And I know you are on the front end of it. When you are trying to hire somebody, how often do you look at the degree as opposed to the skill set? It's, it's that model has changed. A couple of years ago, I was in a meeting uh, with some Air Force uh, people who were complaining that the higher ed sector as a whole was not putting out enough people with STEM degrees. And they went on for about 30 minutes showing data that STEM degrees were on decline and they just couldn't hire people and how it was a major national security threat because people weren't coming in with the right skill sets. Well, what I saw there was completely the opposite of what I was seeing at our university. Our STEM degrees had grown 25 or 24 uh, percent relative to three or four years prior to that. So I walked up to this uh, four-star general and I said, you know, I, I see a disconnect. And over the lunch break, I was talking to them and I said, well, when you talk about STEM degrees, what's the skill set you're looking for? What, what is it? What do you want these people to do? And he said, I need people who can do programming, because without that, we can't function. And I said, well, it's not the computer science majors who do programming. Our art majors do programming. They are the ones who are making the biggest video games. Our finance students do programming. They're the ones who are driving the high-speed trading in Wall Street. Our, you know, mathematicians are doing programming. They're the ones doing the big data analytics. So programming is no longer tied to a degree. The problem there really was that in the Air Force hiring structure, when a person with an engineering degree retires or leaves, they can only hire a person with an engineering degree. And I said, the problem is maybe partly with higher ed, but the problem really is you need to go to DC and change how you do your HR system. Because it's not, it's not the degree that matters, it's the competency that matters. And that's where, again, EL becomes really important. The other big thing I say at the bottom is our EL requirement, our experiential learning requirement says every student must do at least one experience before they graduate. What we see is once the student does one, they don't want to stop. They want to do a second and a third and a fourth. They want to do as much as we can, which then it's a great thing. It's a great thing for our students, but it's a nightmare for me in some ways because now I have to not create 29,000 opportunities. I may have to do four times that many opportunities for our students. Um, so why is this important? Um, again, these are trends. I'm sure you are very familiar with it. 85% uh, of the jobs are predicted to disappear um, and be replaced by jobs we don't know what will come. About 50% or so of the work today can be automated. We are seeing that all the time. Uh, again, as an example, I was in a uh, in a task force set up by the system about a year ago and in that you know they were saying what should the university system statewide do to prepare the workforce of the future and so in that conversation we were talking with several industry partners and one of them was complaining that higher ed again they're not talking about Georgia they're talking about the entire university system they're not preparing people with the right skill set. People come in and they don't know how to do A, B, C, and D. And I said, well, wait a minute. What you're talking about is, again, programming is a thing that comes up over and over, but there are other skill sets too. I said, our, our goal is not to create people who know how to run a spreadsheet or to run a machine or to go you know, press a button here, because that job is very short term. 
you know, the, the factories of today will be replaced by something else tomorrow. Our job is to produce people who create the innovations that drive tomorrow's workforce. Ultimately, the vast majority of students are freshmen coming in, they're 18, 19 year olds, and they have a 40 year career window ahead of them. Our training should not be something that's focused on the entry level job. Our training and our preparation needs to be focused on what that will be in 20 years time. And what that will be, nobody really knows, except we know it won't be what it is today. And that pace of that change is only accelerating. Um, so the next 20 years is a period of change that really is a big challenge. It's, it's redefining how we live, how we work, how we play. And if you have the right skills, you have the opportunities to be really, really, really successful. But the skills that succeeded students 20 years ago will not be the skills that help them succeed 20 years from now. So what we follow, and just as an illustration, that's that's the pace of change. That's the Shanghai China skyline between 1990 on the left and 2010 on the right. So um, you know, hard to believe, but this is happening all over the world. So it's not just there, but it's changing everywhere. So what the, the model we follow is really trying to help students develop what's called the T-shaped skills. Um, you've got <coughs> the, the concept really came out of some internal work group in IBM many years ago. The idea is you, you create deep disciplinary knowledge, uh, and that's your main study, that's your what you learn in your major, in your degree, whatever major you pick. But you have to couple that with a broad range of set, broad set of skills, you know, and that's everything about engaging with people, getting some basic communication skills, better writing, understanding data, understanding how how things work. Because no matter what you do, uh, it's no longer the world is no longer limited to just your own disciplinary knowledge. You, whether it's an entry level job or or research, I mean, even on the front lines of the biggest discoveries today, those discoveries are rarely coming from deep within a single discipline. They are mostly coming from the margins of disciplines where one group of scientists work with another group of scientists, and it's their combined knowledge that's really pushing society forward. So it's that T-shaped model that we are trying to develop by creating all kinds of programs, and experiential learning really helps do that top end, the, the, the top level uh, development for our students. Um, it obviously powers cognitive, emotional, and social engagement skills. When you combine those skills with proper disciplinary knowledge, with the technical, scientific, current practices in whatever major a student chooses, that to us will give you the best combination of skill sets to succeed in the future. So what do you do to help connect this? First of all, if I have to, to create two or three student experiences for all 29,000 of our students, we can't do it alone. We really need you to help us doing it. Uh, we need you to engage with our experiential learning office, with different colleges, with different departments, with the faculty you're, you're used to working with, in creating those opportunities to help students go in and get some real world experience. You know, when I graduated, and probably Probably when many of you graduated, the world was different. You kind of graduated, you took a job, and then you learned how to do the job in the first six months of the job. It's very, very, very different now. You are expected to do the job two months before you graduate. And it's that experiential learning process that really helps you uh, get there. But there is something in it for you. Um, the way I see industry evolving, the big growth is limited really by talent. It's not limited by capital, it's not limited by markets, it's not limited by infrastructure. Those are increasingly becoming easier and easier. It's really going to be affected by access to talent. And by engaging with these students, particularly when you have a student body that's top five or top eight percentile in the whole country, 
you have the ability to engage with the talent much, much sooner. So there is something for you all to gain from it. It's a, it's a potential for a partnership that can go a long way for everybody to succeed. How you can do it, it's, it's very variable. It's, it's very, very different how it, how it works for industry A versus industry B, how it works for a student who's pursuing a major in you know, finance versus a student who's doing a major in biology. So, good side note, that those interestingly are students for some weird reason, that's a very popular double major combination, which blew my mind when I first saw it. Why would a student want to do biology and finance? But that's one of our most popular students. And I finally figured out why. A lot of students say, well, I really want to be a doctor, but if I don't get into med school, that's what I want to do. So go. But anyway, you know, the, the exact um, nature of the experiential learning opportunity will vary by major and by the industry. But our EL uh, scope is wide enough to capture and help you create those kind of opportunities. And that's why Andrew and his team becomes critical. Because this is, we, we've started this two years ago, but it's still evolving. We are still developing an infrastructure. We are still developing rubrics. We are still developing the support system. And as we uncover new opportunities and new options for our students, we have the ability to shape this. So it's something that is a win-win situation for everybody. So I encourage you to talk to Andrew or contact him later about how you and your office can engage with this initiative. Um, there's another part of it that, that really is, is important, and uh, Porter mentioned this a little while ago. You know, I, I want you to think about this a little differently. Um, uh, there should be a figure here, but for some reason it's, it didn't download, I suppose. You know, the figure here shows, and I can email it to you if you're interested, uh, it was published in the Wall Street Journal uh, about a week ago. Uh, last week or so, we hit the 10-year anniversary after the stock market collapsed post-banking crisis. Uh, since then, the stock market is up, what, 250-some percent. If you look at where the job growth has been in the last 10 years, it is almost exclusively for people with advanced degrees and uh, higher education. It has stagnated for people with associate degrees. It's been almost zero growth. It's almost negative for people who have a high school degree or less. What that tells us is higher education today is more central, is more valuable, more critical to society than it has probably ever been in our history. And it is really important for us as a society to make sure that those benefits are spread across the board. As a land-grant university, uh, UGA's student body is very much a reflection of our state. 22% of our students come from families that are Pell eligible. Pell grants are federal grants given to students from low-income households. 22%, that's roughly 6,500 students at today's enrollment numbers, are students who are coming with families which have very, very, very low total income. About 40% of those have, have income levels so low that they have zero contribution to their, they have an ability to contribute absolutely nothing to their students, to their kids' uh, higher education expenses. They are the ones we try to provide as much funding as we can. About 5% of our students are first generation. And they're first in their families to attend college. They are very talented. By the way, our I see our uh, admissions office. Our admissions process is needs blind. The admissions office doesn't even know what the financial needs of our students is. When these students come into UGA, they are there because they are academically just as competitive as anybody else. I had a student about a year ago at an event much like this. I was talking to a student who is first in her family to go to college, has never had her parents, siblings, anybody. And I was talking to her. I said, hey, what do you, what, what I, what do you want to do when you graduate? And she's trying to be a pediatrician. I said, great. Have you 
talk to our pre-medical advising office because they tell you what to do and how to do it to make a competitive application to medical school. And she said, oh, I didn't even know such an office existed. And, and that's, you know, it's not money because this student was funded through a scholarship program. That's the event I met her at. But this was a student who unfortunately has missed out. She was a year from graduating. But if, if my kid says to me, I'm interested in being a pediatrician, in the first year I'll say, go see this office. Or here's my doctor friend, I'll see if you can set you up with an internship or a shadowing program. Because those are the things, in addition to academics, that's what the med school admission is looking for to help you get into a medical school. But for a first generation student, it's that layer that's missing. And even though we have a system at the university to do it, we don't have a system to find people and take them to the office that can help it. 15% of our students are from rural areas. Uh, incidentally, about 17% of the Georgia population is from the rural areas. Very well balanced. Again, they show up, their class is sometimes bigger than an entire high school. And their, their academics are fine. It's their involvement, it's their ability to connect and find these opportunities is what can make the difference between success 10 years later and failure 10 years later. Embark is a program that helps students who are legally homeless. These are students coming from foster homes, broken families, orphanages, who literally have no address and no family. At any given time, we have 250 to 300 of those students on our campus. They want to be like any other student on campus, and yet they have adversity that most of us have never even imagined uh, facing. Every time we try and build a program like experiential learning, my worry is how do we make sure that this group of people is not left behind? So if I create an internship program in Atlanta, and you are generous enough to open your doors and say, here's how we can help train your students. There is always another cost for the student. A student from one of this population may not take it simply because they don't have the money or even a car to actually drive here twice a week to doing it. Even if we create a program in Athens, and I've seen this happen, we created a program in the lo local schools just down the road, two and a half miles from my office, North Campus, for students to gain some hands-on experiential learning experience, tutoring students and doing some other activities. There was a student who could have and should have done it and didn't do it because getting into the school system needed a background check. The background check cost $99 and the student didn't have $99 to pay for it. So every time we build anything that tries to push the envelope, we also have to be sensitive to saying, how do we make sure that a part of our student body is equally able to access those and benefit from that as every other student is able to. So the other thing I'm hoping you all can pay attention to is how do we make sure that those opportunities are available for every student, not just some students. To the extent possible, we can do that if as you create those opportunities, find innovative ways to do them where they are effectively cost neutral to the students. There are several examples of that, and I know there's more opportunities for us to innovate on that front. And then, of course, I know Georgia Commitment Scholarship has been a really big driver of this, but there are other opportunities to, to help just provide the small scholarships uh, to help students do anything. You know, we, and we, we have in Andrew's office runs an experiential learning scholarship program, as does Terry College, as do other colleges at the university. Um, and we fund everything from those $100 fees to get the background check done to $3,500 to buy a drone so somebody can create you know, some innovative way of tracking 
animal health on a dairy farm in South Georgia. You know, we've we've funded all kinds of things. We've we've literally funded a small satellite data center. Those of you who may know this. There is a uh, uh, Don is nodding. Uh, a team on on UGA about to send two micro satellites. Uh, they are they are at a 106 day countdown now. NASA is going to be sending their micro satellite up in space, and the second one will follow. So we, you know, UGA is just such a fascinating space. Everything from satellites to very ground level stuff, making cupcakes, right, Don? I mean, he's got one of those in Terry College, actually. Um, and, and there is just immense opportunity. But we can't do this successfully unless we have your partnership. And we can't do this at scale unless we have your partnership. So I encourage you to talk to Andrew, to me, to Terry College, and find ways to help doing this because ultimately, if our students win, we all win. Thank you. Um, let, me, let me leave with one short video of a student who just finished her uh, uh, experiential learning initiative. By the way, we started to do this in our office. So we have now a student team of four people who does 80, 90% of our marketing communication efforts. That means everything from creating content, developing newsletters, creating websites, doing the analytics on websites, finding traffic flow, social media. They are overseen by one person in our office and it has been just so much fun working with them because for them, it's a, it's a job. They come in Monday morning, I say, here are your goals. Some of those are very hard deadlines. This one was finished. This video was done by that same team, by the way. Um, but this presentation was developed by the same team as well under a very time deadline. So they're getting some real world work-like experience. But then it's an ability for me to get a computer science person who's doing some really cool web design stuff. By the way, he just got a job with Amazon moving to Seattle next year um, to some PR marketing people who are saying, if I could do this on the website, how do I need to change my content so it takes advantage of that stuff? So anyway, here's a short video of a student who happens to be a Terry College major. Happy to take your questions as needed. Um, we'll pass around a microphone. Carlos, can we get that microphone from you? Yes. Is that all? <coughs> Anyone have any questions? <coughs> uh, more 
question. Uh, you, had, you had mentioned that we admit about 51 to 100 students, I think, each fall. Uh, Roughly. 55 to 57, typically, yes. Will we ever increase that number or? Very gradually. See, we, you know, it's, it's not easy to do that because you, you need to have advisors and financial aid people and classrooms and parking spots and dining halls and buses and it's, it's not as easy as saying we can. I mean, we have 30,000 people wanting to get in, so if you want it, we could. Um, but we also want to make sure that we only take in the number that we can successfully graduate. There's no point getting another 100 students if we can't get them into a chemistry lab and then they can't graduate. So yes, I mean, very, very gradually, but it has to be done uh, systematically. I mean, one of the things is the sooner we can get them to graduate, the more we can take in on the back end, right? So um, enrollment management is a very, very difficult uh, and complicated challenge. I have not seen your T-shaped learning uh, diagram before. Is there any effort to get students from the different schools at the University of Georgia to work together while yes. they're in school? Yes, that's, I'm glad you mentioned it. Uh, there are several programs now which are largely, uh, again, around problem solving and not necessarily tied to disciplines or majors. So, uh, Grady College, for example, has one that's uh, called the New Media Institute. Again, some of you may be working with them already, where we they get teams of students, irrespective of what college they are from or what major they are from, around a, a real-world problem to say, how do we solve problem X? And they make teams of three, four, five, six students, and then they have a sometimes semester, sometimes longer effort to try and solve the problem. There's a similar program being that was piloted through the honors program last semester. It'll be launched on a more formal way this fall. A third one is, again, similar kind, more with the community-based organizations. It's coming out through um, so School of Social Work. There's the service learning program, uh, Archway Partnerships that works with communities all over the state. So there are multiple programs programs like that. Uh, some are driven mostly by academic programs. Others are driven by people from the outside who come in and say, here's a big challenge facing the peanut industry. How do you solve it? Then you take it back and connect it to the right faculty and the right students and say, how do we uh, try and uh, address that? The Innovation District, I'm sure you've heard of that. That is this, this kind of things will become a big part of the Innovation District effort as well. Yes. Um, my daughter graduated last year from Georgia and had many, many experiential learning opportunities. Just how great it was to have that experience. Um, and I'm curious, I have been, I um, in, am in human resources and I do recruiting and EGA students are awesome. I love hiring them. But I have become familiar with some students who are challenged in the freshman sophomore year to get involved and have that, the story you mentioned about the young student who didn't know about the medical it seems as though to me that students um, do a lot of their investigating and looking for things online and, and hit roadblocks or aren't sure where. What, what are your thoughts around making sure they understand how to, what all the opportunities are and how to engage? Yeah. Like there's just this challenge of knowing how to get involved and knowing how to engage and there's so many opportunities. What, what are you so the great great observation and that really is is the is the crux of the issue. The, a lot of times we have more resources than students know about. Um, a lot of times the students who make the effort or have just a natural personality to go out and reach out, they find their way. But the ones who don't, they tend to retreat or they tend to aggregate with more people like themselves and they insulate themselves further. And so that's a, a growing partnership between, you know, we've traditionally we've seen academics as what happens in the classroom. And increasingly we are saying learning is not restricted to just the classroom. There is as much happening outside as 
as inside the classroom that matters. So we are doing more partnerships with housing, for example, the kinds of programs that are done in that residential housing. We have, not all universities have a live-in requirement, but UGA does. I think it's a great opportunity because it forces students to uh, sort of engage in a different way, uh, particularly ones who are not used to or don't have a natural personality to be more gregarious, for lack of a better word. Uh, and we need to extend that beyond the first semester and the first year. So we, we are working with student affairs. We are creating the kinds of programs that allow students. And a great example, uh, Don, you may be aware, you may know this, you may be running this, is the, uh, what's it called, the dog camp innovation that's going to be kicked yep. off this summer. So that's, that's one of the things we're doing is so there'll be an extended orientation called, they have dog camp, and it's a general one, and they have some that are feed. So those dog camps are, are one week orientations where you get exposed to a lot more things than you do in the Monday. And we also have the President's Council on the first year experience. That's that's something we started last year. Freshman College is a six week program that uh, that it's been there for many years, but about three or four years ago we decided freshman college is a six week program. Students instead of starting in the fall, you start late summer, take some course credit and are better prepared to step into the fall. And historically it was as a remedial program. It was for students who were struggling with math or chemistry or English to get, boost up their skills before the real school started. Well, when you have that student body, there isn't much remedial instruction needed. So we completely changed it and said, well, how do we get students a jump start in their program? And that became a really successful uh, program. And then a year ago, we said, now how do we open that up to students who really need it? So we've created freshman college scholarships focused towards students from rural areas. So they are not hitting college when 30,000 students descend, but they hit college when there are 4,000 students. So there's a, there's a step up. And same thing for uh, students with low income backgrounds. That's been a real challenge because sometimes these are the students who are not only taking advantage of this program because they can't afford it, but they are hit in a double way because they are the breadwinners for their family. So if they go into school six weeks early, that's six weeks less income for their families. Um, so you know, bit by bit we are, we are building it. The, the freshman experience is actually much better now than it was. I think the gap now is what happens after the first year. So we've, we've now created at UGA a system where the transition from home to college is actually not that bad. But then there's almost a cliff. You go from first year to second year, and now you're kind of on your own. The ones who have that social network navigate it very well. The ones who don't, they sometimes miss out on those opportunities. A great observation. I think your point with um, the STEM and the, the conversation with the four-star general you know, extremely valid. Um, and you're know, coming an engineer from Virginia Tech, and my son is an MIS. Yeah, I told him that you know MIS is really the future. Like that's the engineering of what the engineering was. But your point, yeah, I think it really hit home because you're seeing it. You're you're on the front end of it. But in general, academia, I mean, you still feel like they're still a little bit behind on that overall. And then on the private side, I mean, you're saying go change HR, you know, in the government, which we know that that would be very hard to do. <laughs> And about 2025. 20, what, what, what does the private sector need to do? Because I think STEM is still a stigma, right? I mean, it, it's, it's more about, we're looking more for the skill set versus just well, what the degree is. He, a lot of the interest in STEM is driven by the perception that STEM degrees are a key to economic success, financial success. To some extent, industry has really propagated it by saying, I need, I'm going to recruit a physics major over a humanities major. As a parent of three little children and seeing higher ed from the inside, I see, I see a, a failure in some way because to me there are two kinds of majors. There are, there are the pre-professional majors. You know, you have, healthcare is a great example. A lot of the healthcare degrees 
You have your entry level job is a graduate degree. And to get into the graduate degree, there's a very specific undergraduate pathway to get in physical therapy, right? If you want to get a physical therapy degree, a uh, job, you have to have, used to be a master's, now it's a doctorate. Pharmacy is another one, audiology is another one. Lots of healthcare degrees are that way. So there are majors that are sort of pre-professional majors. And then there's everybody else. Um, whether you take a biology degree, or a psychology degree, or an art degree, if your job is going to be, your entry level job is going to be in the service industry, or in the retail side, or in probably 60, 70% of the jobs, entry level jobs in any industry, it doesn't matter what your degree is, as long as you have some basic skills. And the two things in my opinion is a really good handle on data, data literacy, and two, a really good skill set on communication and, and just interdisciplinary work culture. If you can develop those two things, you will be successful no matter what. People talk about programming, but programming is fast becoming commoditized. I mean, there are apps to help you make apps now. So do you really need programming to make an app, or do you use an app to help make you make an app? So, you know, AI is another one. Everybody's talking about AI, and I, and I know, I, I use AI in my own work. My startup company was have, making heavy use of AI before AI was a buzzword. Big data is a buzzword now. But they are becoming commoditized. It's your ability to understand and utilize what's out there. That will drive the next layer of stuff. So I think as an industry, you're right. You have to be looking beyond majors and into competencies. And as a university, we need to be promoting that competency development irrespective of what the major is. And it's that marriage that will really have propel it. And so we are trying to do our part through competencies, uh, through experiential learning, partly. That's not the only way of doing it. There, there are several other steps in motion as well. And then hopefully the workplace will increasingly go that way. I, I do see that change happening. I mean, for the last 10 years, humanities was the punching bag for everybody, from politicians to industry leaders to even universities. Uh, and I think they've hit rock bottom and there is a change that's happening. I'm seeing more and more op-eds from CEOs or successful venture capitalists saying how their humanities and critical thinking skills they developed as a history major helped them do whatever they do today. And I think that shift will be happening. Now, I can also tell you, universities are partly to blame because some history departments have been great at saying, how do I change my curriculum and how do I change my requirements and what kind of training we do, and others have not. Others have said, this is how I was trained in 1965, therefore, this is how we should keep training. So, you know, the, the problem with higher ed is, is really that inconsistency, and I'm talking higher ed as a whole. Uh, we, we, our failure has been because we've been really good in some places, but we have not been good at other places. And sometimes it's the failures that draw public attention, and it's overshadowed by the successes that we we had. Maybe one more question. Well, um, our, our admissions process is increasingly becoming more and more holistic. We, we, we used to be numbers driven, and to some degree we still are. Um, but those number driven application admission process is sort of reaching the end of its value for us. Uh, the reason is when of the 29,000 students who apply, when 18,000 have a 4.0 GPA. I can't really use GPA as a decision metric on whether or not I should uh, 
pick one student over the other. So increasingly, our admission process is becoming more looking at what your overall development is. And yes, you need good grades, uh, but you also need to have a, a package that shows that you are pushing yourself. And for future students, that's the ability. And, and that's measured in different ways. We look at curriculum difficulty. Did you get a 4.0 GPA because you took the easiest courses in your school? Or did you get 4.0 GPA because you took the most difficult courses available to you? What's available in South Georgia is very different than what's available in Atlanta. So we are aware of that. But we are looking at the relative difficulty, not just the GPA. So sometimes a student with 3.8 or 3.9 GPA gets in, and a student with 4.0 doesn't, because you see evidence that the 4.0 came because you took a certain set of courses, and the 3.8 came from another set of courses. I also get to speak to orient students at orientation. You know, the, the thing I really try to push there to students, and particularly their parents, um, is, Look, you made it. You're at UGA. You made it here because you've learned to succeed. But what I want students to do in their four years at UGA, or five, um, <laughs> is, uh, is how to learn to fail. Because it's not learning to succeed that helps you really succeed later. It's learning to fail and recovering from it that helps you succeed. Right? And so sometimes a student who's straight A, does everything perfectly, has never failed, goes into the workforce, takes one big hit, and doesn't know how to respond. And what you really want is somebody who takes that punch, gets angry, throws things at the wall, comes back next day and says, I'm going to do it again. <laughs> right? And, and that's, that's the defining. So isn't that what you're looking for when you hire people? Isn't that what you want your own kids to do? I mean, I, I know I do. I'm, I'll push my kids. I'm like, OK, good. Do it. Fail. Be unhappy. It's OK to be unhappy. But if you get depressed by something little, that's not good enough. If you know how to recover from it, that's what you really want. So again, experiential learning, hard feedback. I, I, the PR team that I work with, I give them hard feedback. I tell them, that's not good. Go back and do it again. By the way, I, I have two hours. I need this in two hours. It's OK. They are unhappy. But that's OK, because that's, that's the learning experience. Right? So, so to me, that's the value. And for admissions, I know that bit by bit we are we are going that way. And again, we are very sensitive to to how this how what we do in admissions can impact you know as a student from a low income background versus really my kids. My kids are privileged in, in our society. They have read more books before they hit 10, when well, my young, eldest is 11, she loves to read. She has more, she has read more books now than most kids, an average kid would read in their lifetime. My kid, uh, this, this was an eye-opening personal experience. A few years ago, my kids were having breakfast. My, my kids are 11, eight, and almost five, five next month. They were sitting at the breakfast table, they had a glass of milk, and one of them picked up their glass, raised it, and said, Nostrovia, and drank it. And I was in the kitchen, and I said, those of you who don't know, that's Polish for cheers. Um, I said, where, where does an 11-year-old pick up Nostrovia? Where in the world kids who grew up in the United States pick up Nostrovia, right? And it occurred to me two years ago, a research scientist friend of mine who was visiting my lab ended up lived, staying, you know, we have several people visiting. I had a sci guy, brilliant scientist from Bulgaria, this gentleman from, uh, lives in California, uh, investor in the Silicon Valley, but originally from Poland, stayed with us. And so at night, we were having a good drink, and we must have said Nostrovia. They were around. We didn't teach it to them. They picked it up. <laughs> and so two years later, they are saying Nostrovia over a glass of milk. <laughs> now, that gives them an advantage 25 years later that another kid will probably never have. 
How do we bridge that gap? It's not an easy thing. But if we don't keep making those little efforts all the time, we will only make that gap bigger and never get to reducing it. So in everything we do, everything I try and do, including things like experiential learning, I'm particularly sensitive. And admissions is one of those things. We want to do it in a calibrated way so we do not disadvantage one group over another. for joining us today since you've decluttered your shelves from the orange and blue and we have a <laughs> keepsake. This is a sculpture by Loretta Eby we give to all of our speakers and we're very grateful for your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming making the effort to find this in our first uh, Terry Third Thursday at the Nova Center. I hope we'll see you back here in April and the best of luck for the rest of your day. Thank you.